Kongres Współpracy Transgranicznej Lublin 2022. Bezpieczeństwo i Solidarność. Coroczne spotkanie praktyków współpracy transgranicznej z Unii Europejskiej i Partnerstwa Wschodniego. Trzy dni paneli, spotkań i debat liderów samorządowych, organizacji pozarządowych i ekspertów z całej Europy. Forum Partnerów. Giełda Grantodawców. Wizyty studyjne, warsztaty, koncerty i spektakle. Na żywo i online. Lublin, 5-7 października 2022. Zarejestruj się bezpłatnie na stronie kongres.lublin.eu. Witam serdecznie w trzecim dniu kongresu. Good morning everyone. This is day three of our Congress of Cross-Border Cooperation. Welcome everyone here on site and everybody else watching us online. This is the last day of our convention. The last but very exceptional because we are going to launch talks that are going to continue throughout next year. Next year Lublin is the European capital of youth and next year we will work on how the young, the people who are going to decide the future of this place very soon, how the young should, how they may get involved in the decision-making processes in this city. We we'll start with a panel on the youth working for inter cultural integration. We'll talk about youth policies and throughout the day, in parallel to our sessions, there are also cultural events and we close today with Professor Rothfeld's lecture. Maybe. When we think about perhaps the most outstanding experts in international law, in global affairs, people who can explain the meaning of what is going on in international relations. In the context of uh, Russo-Ukrainian war, I believe that Professor Rothfeld is one of them. Expert. One of the greatest experts in uh, international law, former Minister of Foreign Affairs. He's the guy who's really worth listening to and whom we should listen. So I hope you will stay with us throughout the day and let's open the first panel Beyond Borders, Young People in Action for Intercultural Integration. Alina Januszczyk, Dariusz Jachimowicz, the floor is yours, guys. Thank you, Director, for opening this uh, session. We will host it together with Alina. Thank you very much for coming so early. The first panel in the morning is always a challenge. You have to wake up, put yourself together, pull yourself together and come on time. So let's uh, introduce uh, the people who are going to speak with us. But I believe everybody will have a chance to, to voice uh, their opinions. Well, we are expecting some more people here in the room and some people are online. <laughs> and, well, look, Darek, I think we are lacking one chair. One extra chair will be just the job. You know, people of the humanities uh, only think about what to say and not necessarily how to go around technicalities. Well, we have uh, with us uh, Anna Lewicka koksanowicz coordinator at the Lublin Social Committee to IG Ukraine. We have Ola Bożenska, Strefa Dorastania Foundation, Joanna Lewandowska, a, a volunteer, humanitarian volunteer working in different places. Wait, uh, guys, perhaps uh, because we would like to show you a short video. So first, I believe you should stay where you are and then we will invite you to join us here on the chairs. We also have with us Łukasz Łagut, representing Child's Villages, also related to Flor Longton, 
a panelist from World Child Netherlands. She will join us online in a moment. And Natalia Yeremieva, advisor at Early Childhood and School Section European Vegeland Center, Norway. Well, here she is. Great. So she's on site. And Vincent von Gondola, coordinator uh, from Open Culture Center Spain. Trabajador. But first, have a look at the video. To wszystko zaczęło się bardzo, bardzo szybko. Well, it started really fast. Nobody expected this kind of situation. After the outbreak of the war, we were all shocked. I was totally surprised, also with how people wanted to help. It was very emotional. We were looking for ways to do more. On the 24th of, of February, just a couple of hours after the invasion, Lublin Social Committee of Aiding Ukraine started. It was a mixture of people from NGOs, uh, civil servants, volunteers, people helping Ukrainian refugees. So right from the start, together with different actors, different entities, mainly some municipal institutions, but also NGOs, they were opening up day rooms for kids. And the other area was to provide childcare to people who were accommodated in collective shelters. Well, we started working really fast. Uh, within the first week, we were able to organize different kinds of aid through Facebook. Well, I found out where we can go as volunteers to help, and this is how we started. And ever since, uh, we tried to visit all the shelters at least a couple of times a week. Well, every, at the beginning, you do everything you can. Uh, you try to respond. So even uh, we supported those who were helping, not necessarily refugees. And the most beautiful help you can offer is your time. Well, we didn't have full control, but we decided to be there. I was there for the kids. I was serving them. I was responding to emotions, to uh, symptoms, um, uh, the feelings that they were giving off just to make them have a good time. That was a really challenging time, requiring us to be patient, to be humble. We went there, we approached the kids with our offer. Despite certain cultural barriers, we tried to open up, and of course, leave the other party a choice. Well, this is how it started. We just came there together. We talked, and it wasn't just a question, do you want it or not? The question was, when can we do this? Let's do it. And this is how we started working with the kids. That was really complicated, really chaotic. If you imagine you know, people staying overnight, new people coming in all the time. Many people just after crossing the border were brought there. They were so tired. They just wanted some place to sleep. Well, people in, in shelters, they changed a lot. They uh, came and uh, went. Some kids were leaving even in the middle of our classes, sometimes a mother would just step in and say, we are moving on. So that was sometimes sad, that the kids sometimes lacked energy to, to be active. Uh, our job was to uh, kill the time, was to offer some kind of activities, some kind of leisure with positive energy and positive message and educational aspect behind it. It wasn't only taking care of children. We organized their time to make them forget for a moment about everyday troubles. 
and we also helped parents who were able simply to leave the kids with us and just start doing something else. We tried to offer time, our ideas, our patience. Although we didn't really speak the language very well, I feel that that language of communication was culture. And through activities, we were able to learn each other, learn from each other. So we responded to that situation, of course, not only to the needs of adults that were offered very basic uh, staff, uh, clothes, foodstuffs, but also offered some kind of opportunity to develop culturally. So this was the body and spirit. Uh, we tried to take care of their well-being, of uh, feeling secure. And it was all also about building self-confidence. Well, culture is an indispensable element of help. When you look at refugee camps, you know, we didn't have any refugee camps. The point was uh, they were allowed to bring their culture and actually speak their voice, speak their minds. And it's the role of uh, cultural institutions to uh, make people feel a sense of belonging. Cultural institutions responded really quickly, but everybody in a different way, depending on available resources. And there was huge integration and exchange between local institutions uh, sharing best practices and, and ideas. So the great role of cultural institutions, I must say, they just, you know, press this power button they had and started working really effectively. I believe the city of Lublin handled the situation very well. Uh, this is my, my personal feeling. It, it was, again, the moment when we got together, we got integrated in different constellations. That was really very expected, very needed, what we did. We didn't want to create groups, segments. We didn't want to create new dividing lines between communities. We always try to include include them, include the newcomers, integrate the newcomers. Well, having those uh, day rooms was a great idea. We were able to learn the culture, customs of another country. And we were very peaceful about my kids being in good hands in a big group where they were able to learn the new country. I think uh, the kids, in a sense, they started to appreciate the Polish culture and what we do for Ukraine. They sometimes try to combine, um, and we help them combine the two cultures. This was seen in, in drawings, for example, in games. And us and them, this, this dividing line gradually disappeared. The places where children go, they are always received very well. They like it here. And Polish adults also treat them well. They really get adapted easily. They're happy, they're satisfied, they feel calm and peaceful. Uh, Alina Januszczyk called me the other day and proposed that she may take care of my kids. Uh, and I said, where are my kids supposed to go? Uh, whom are they going to be with? And she explained just play with other kids from Poland, from Ukraine, including those fleeing war. Thank you very much. I want to thank all volunteers. We wouldn't have been able to make it with, uh, without you. You were the heroes of that time, and I'm very, very grateful. My heartfelt thanks to all of you. Well done together. I'm very happy. I was part of it, and many children benefited from your time, from your effort, and you still 
keep working for them. This is absolutely great. Thank you very much. Uh, the applause is absolutely well deserved. Uh, those who look at us, uh, who watch us online, obviously uh, a lot of us have a lot of uh, business on our uh, hands and hands. I would like to reverse the situation. I would like, I would like to inv invite you, dear volunteers, I would like, w we would be happy to thank you right now, to say thank you directly to you. Uh, David, Magda, Dominika, please come here. Uh, Natalia, please, please come here. Grzegorz Nowicki. Nadia. Nadia. Tak. Um, kto jeszcze jest tutaj na sali? I'm looking for other people who are here. Okay, Agata. Tak, please tak. come here. I would be happy to have you all here. I need to have a look around to see who's, who's there. Right, so these are the people. Please come here to the center of, of our lounge, of our room. Było nas bardzo wiele. There were so many of us. We helped one another, we helped others, and we supported one another. There was no occasion so far, uh, but we see one another, you know, we see oneself in person. Uh, uh, some of us, I mean, I knew some of us uh, some of you before, but we uh, uh, definitely uh, g got to know one another online. And this is lovely to have this opportunity, but we meet physically in situ for the first time. You know, this is how we can build teams in, in, uh, in a collective, collaborative value without previous pre-rules, uh, uh, some kind of a priori uh, uh, assumptions. Many, many thanks to all of you once again. I would like to ask uh, I would like to uh, grant to you some thank you note uh, uh, designed by Jarek Kozjara. You know the person well uh, engaged in a, a lot of cultural uh, uh, issues in the Lublin space. Now let me let me show you. Uh, okay. I'd like to. Uh, I love I love giving uh, flowers to people, and we have a wonderful gift for you because uh, one of the Ukrainian refugees, uh, she made such flowers, uh, so uh, they are uh, lovely and tasty at the same time. So, uh, so please take them. I hope this will pay you for the effort of getting here very early, and I hope we'll be able to pass the rest to those who are not here. I hope this is going to be a sweet thank you, and uh, I also believe that uh, the reward of your activity is in you right now, inside of you. So once again, applause for all present here, and uh, feel invited to take part in the panel in the hall. Uh, conference day today, Congress day. Zapraszamy naszych gości. And now I'd like to ask our panelists to take their seats. Ja tylko bym prosiła o zestaw. I'd like to ask for interpreting set. Darku też dla ciebie. Dobrze. 
chciałbym jeszcze sprawdzić, czy są z nami na... I'd like to uh, z... check whether our panelists online are with us. Are we connected? Floro. We can see... Uh, Vincent van Grunden. We can see Vincent and we can see... Uh... Tutaj też was widać, świetnie. Pozdrawiamy was. Ok, so uh, Vincent and Willem. Ok, słuchajcie... Uh... Tak zastanawialiśmy się trochę z Darkiem. Okay, we were thinking uh, uh, before the meeting today. We were thinking with Darek, what does it mean young people who act for uh, for the benefit of integration, for the idea of integration? I think it's not only young people who act to the benefit of integration, and maybe the energy that uh, that is part of youth makes us act, makes us active. So maybe let's start our talk about the this energy. What's the drive? What's the kind of engine inside of you, in, in your countries and here, that makes the power, that makes you, that empowers you uh, to start each important narrative, each important story? Let me start. In my case, this was, and I believe that was perhaps true for, uh, we, we, for, for a lot of us, I felt solidarity with people with whom I work every day. I live, I, uh, I'm, I'm a member of a community. And you know, on the 24th of February, I, uh, it wasn't thinkable for me, you know, to get to business as usual, to, to li live my life as if nothing had happened. So that was the first incentive, that was the first uh, idea. And you know, then when it started, the whole, the whole, uh, mm, the whole set of actions uh, began, tr was, was triggered. I would like to ask about this Perpetuum Mobile that you mentioned, that this uh, never-ending set of actions that, that this situation uh, uh, ignited in a way. So we are talking about the time after the 24th of February, but we, are, we have also people who are active or activists before that time, or had been activists before that time. And uh, they were active in fields called helping or aid uh, related areas. So Asha, Asha is a person, uh, I'm just looking at you, and, and obviously you're, you're a person who uh, had not waited for the war to begin, so to say. I mean, what was the drive before, in your case? What was the reason for your reaction? Good morning, everyone. I'm also smiling at you. And uh, I've been working in a foundation. In Poland, we are called uh, 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 Red Noses, Clowns in Hospitals, humanita uh, humanitarian organization. We have uh, hundreds of people from a number of countries, uh, from European, from Palestinian, uh, and we have uh, 30 years of uh, our experience. I've been working for seven years. But my drive, I believe, you know, when I saw an, uh, mm, an advertisement, a kind of uh, publicity uh, on Facebook, and I knew one person, and you know, when I saw that, I was so focused on, on this objective, and you know, I never felt that. It's like, I'm, I'm sure I want to do this, and you know, as if having no choice but go this way. So you know, in a way, step by step, I was able to discover, uh, uh, you know, I said, uh, I, I'm a volunteer, but mm, this is not absolutely true, I mean, not. We are medically educated and we have a long system of education and in some sense we do earn some money for that. So from the early stages when I started observing the work, as it turns out hospital work is very helpful when you work in different problematic situations, emergency cases all over the world. Uh, like uh, refugee camps, uh, and, and thanks thanks to you that 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 Poland did not witness the rise of uh, refugee camps, uh, because I know the experience from uh, other places in the world. So in my case, we have a spark at the beginning. I'm discovering myself in what I'm doing, uh, and that, that I'm becoming myself because what I do. And then, yeah, Perpetuum Mobile once again. Does the decision 
to start helping change the situation around you what about your family environment what about what about your life environment career environment career trajectories but to trzeba mieć jakąś odwagę you know you, you have to be uh, courageous enough to make this decision for your life well thanks to my work i learned and i realized danie że odwaga you know i realized that courage does not mean that you're not afraid quite the reverse is true słyszę o tym że jestem od... so hearing that i'm courageous but you know uh, only my my husband knows how much i'm i'm kind of um, I'm kind of panicking uh, before any kind of action. But, you know, the longer I do it, uh, the, the, the more uh, difficult it is for me to answer who helps whom. You know, just sitting and, uh, and imagining or de deluding myself, I can't see it, uh, and learning what I can do when, when, um, what I can do uh, when helping others. And I can do something not to not to uh, it, not to make the feeling of suffering stronger. And in this way, it makes me benefit from all my actions. Okay, so helping two ways, uh, something that you mentioned, that when you help, you get helped. Uh, in a way, you help yourself. Without those actions, I believe I would be far more uh, uh, bruised by in different senses of my life. And it's very close to me. Natalia, I would like to address you right now. What's your role? What's your vision and, uh, in, in feeling and passing the energy on kids to kids? You work with an organization that works in Ukraine for, for have been working in Ukraine for many years, and you represent yes. Nor Norway. Can you tell us about your experiences a little? We'll speak English and what is important here, I would like to share two reflections. One connected to my work at the European Bergen Center in Oslo, where I work as a coordinator of the program supporting educational reforms in Ukraine. And there we work primarily, where we used to work primarily with teachers before the 24th of February. And then we understood that we had to come up with an emergency response because there are more areas where Norway could help in many ways. And one of those was very much connected to what we saw in the, in the video earlier today. And we called that activity mobile youth work. So what we did, we directed some of the financial support from the program to our teachers and trainers in Ukraine who started working with internally displaced children, primarily in the Western parts of Ukraine where they moved from, from war. And we also realized that after the corona times where children didn't have the possibility to socialize so much and the war has started out of a sudden in Ukraine and children really needed this help from grown-ups to start socializing with each other and with their peer uh, students uh, local students. So what we did, uh, we directed some financial support to our teachers and trainers who started going to the places just like here where internally displaced children uh, lived and started conducting different social activities for them. But also uh, their parents were invited, grandparents, siblings, uh, it, it was uh, other kids, local kids, uh, could come, so it was. It became uh, a huge activity for us. Uh, from May until August, we conducted over 500 different workshops in different regions of Ukraine where there was no military activity, and it was like almost 250 for the school children and almost 300 for preschool children, kindergarten kids. So it, it became like a, a huge movement for us. We, we could not expect that we will, start, we will start targeting kids in this way. And we've realized out of a sudden that our trainers and teachers who usually used to prepare other teachers to be just to uh, promote democratic culture in schools, they will be working directly with kids, with traumatized kids, kids who would need to socialize. And the motor you're speaking about is something that if you're a teacher, you're always a teacher, you're always there to be a helper. And we on our part also try to provide help to the helpers, but that's another story. But this is a very important thing. It's 
just as much important in Poland and other countries where Ukrainian refugees came as in Ukraine. And Norway provided support to that and we are extremely proud of that. Bardzo ci dziękuję, ponieważ um, profesjonalizacja uh, ludzi... Thank you very much, because professional training of people who are helpers is a crucial area. I also believe that in our uh, in Poland we obviously helped, but then we learned how to help, and we are still learning how to help. Now coming to uh, teachers and the role of teaching or education, I think this is a crucial point. I believe that teachers are people who, who do something for the future of communities. And I believe that uh, the war will be over as soon as it is possible, and we will be back to our regular life. And teachers will be the first moment, will be those people who will be responsible for our care, for knowing how, knowing why. Okay. Okay, I would also like to address uh, what Natalia said. I, I felt strongly what you say, once you're a uh, once you're a teacher, you're always a teacher. And the conditions you said, it's as if you, you know, you say it's, it's coming back to the sense of your being a teacher, giving the meaning to it. When you reach to the deepest potential meaning of what you do, I mean, the identity of what you do, life can be barely, trivially um, uh, tiresome and, and, and brings us much... Uh, a side of our sense of living and then you reach a situation in your life an experience like the one we are talking about and you have almost direct access to answering the question what's the sense of my life and as you said it very clearly this formula once a teacher always a teacher it's a kind of state of mind mindset an attitude that is always available once you once you evoke it once you elicit once you uh, adopt it uh, uh, deliberately. Once you, uh, I would like to address uh, Vincent because you work in organizations that have ideas for how to realize help, how to help. And uh, thanks to Monica, I had this uh, this uh, concept of team up. I didn't know organization like like uh, like someone who who uses play and game as a way of helping, as a way of interacting with help, a basic way of reaching a person and supporting a person. Uh, uh, Flor, I would like to ask about your actions. How do you do it? You go to places where there are crises and you offer play, and not only that. Can you tell us more about this? Hi, hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you. Thank you so much for your question. Um, so I'm Floor. I'm an intern at Warchild Holland. And yes, I work for the Team Up Global program, as well as Lucas, who was present there in Lublin with you today. Um, and I can explain shortly how we do it. Um, Team Up is a psychosocial support intervention. And indeed, it is based on games, uh, movement-based activities. Um, and how we do it is locally we train uh, facilitators in our intervention, in the methodology and the theories behind it, um, so they can work with the children. And Team Up consists of uh, once a week sessions with children that are very structured, that have a routine. Team Up is a non-verbal um, intervention, so it's mostly based on demonstration, on body language, body awareness. Um, so also facilitators who don't speak the language of the children they're working with, um, they can work with the children as well. So that's also the case uh, for Lucas, I believe. Um, and how we do it then, these structured sessions, they always start with a sort of an opening and then some main activities, which are uh, games and uh, other movement-based activities. Um, and this is, it's not only play and games, there's a whole theory behind it of how this can help children, for example, in an easy way by reducing some stress, by having a positive experience, um, by improving their social connectedness, by getting in touch with children from different cultural backgrounds. And 
because we work non-verbally, uh, that is possible. So children who don't speak each other's languages can still play together in the sessions. Um, and then our ultimate goal uh, is to improve their psychosocial well-being. So uh, that is the idea behind it. Uh, and evidence has shown that after attending 12 sessions, the children can really feel an impact on their emotional well-being. Um, but also after attending only one or two sessions, which you often see when children are on the move from different refugee shelters, uh, after one or two sessions, they already experience some impact from doing team up. So just the simple stress reduce and having having fun and that they can be a child again for a moment. So um, yeah, that is how we how we do it. That's the idea. You spoke about the body language. It's very relevant in this method, specific rules and body language. This is what helps us understand each other, communicate, and this is, in a way, another language we discovered, which was the language of culture. Narodowy. Communication between nations, regardless of where you come from, Culture was the first kind of common denominator, the language of communication. What is your take about this, uh, on this? Uh, how does it manifest in your places, in your experience? Speaking about body language, the language of culture, uh, I don't wear jackets too much. I, I feel a bit, a bit contained. Uh, I have no chance really to use my bold language as I would like to, but seriously, it's a bit like going back to the child that you have in you. I don't fit to work with children. I, I am what they call fit to work with children, as they wrote on my on my certificate. But I, my first try. I was really tense. I, I didn't speak the language. I didn't know the kids. And I thought to myself, how, how can I even talk to them? But we started to communicate at the body level, at the culture level. And I had a trainer. She was able to speak Ukrainian as originally Ukrainian. And I was completely new to this situation. I just uh, know simple words, but what you can do is to communicate through fun, through games. And so I offer some game and, and uh, I say it's called fox. And the kids say, yes, in my, our country it's called sabachka, which is a dog, doggy. So it shows we, we're not so different. We are together. We call things a bit differently, but we have the same fun. Hola. What language did you speak to the kids? Well, it was the language of gestures. I remember my first visit to, to the shelter. It was completely new for me. We were opening up that day room it's our, in our labyrinth gallery. We didn't have a, an interpreter with us. So we were trying to show gesture. I believe we had really good contact. It was the first uh, team of kids I was trying to activate. I think we have somehow maintained contacts until today through social media. They ask us different questions, how we are, what is going on. And some people I met uh, back then, including volunteers, we are very curious about what, what happens to these children now. And I see that the youth from Ukraine, they, they really mean it. They really want to keep good contacts, make friends and nurture these friendships. So those workshop sessions, games, it was just perhaps an opportunity to talk and, and learn these people. Vincent, I'm smiling at you remotely. Uh, you represent a large organization that works very broadly. 
at different integration fields. Give us a, a background. Tell me, tell me what language do you speak when you approach intercultural problems? Hi, good morning. Do you hear me well? Hi. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, uh, thanks everyone for inviting me. Uh, my name is Anit Vincent. I am working at Open Cultural Center. We are not that large, <laughs> uh, to be honest. We we have two uh, teams working in Spain and Greece, but they're small teams. But yeah, we do a lot, so maybe that counts as large. Um, yeah, it depends a lot where we're where we're talking about um, because the context where we work is very different um, from yeah. Uh, from our locations. In Greece, we work next to a refugee camp. Um, so the main language that we actually speak is English, but we actually work with the people from the camp. So not just like for them, let's say. So indeed we have uh, translators, uh, people that volunteer with us through European projects from the camp um, to actually help make our activities happen. Um, so yeah, in the end, we speak all languages there, but yeah, our main language is English to, to connect with the communities. Um, and in Barcelona, it's also an interesting mix because, um, yeah, we, we work with a way broader group from Latin America, people coming from there, uh, from the Middle East, from different parts of Africa, even from Eastern Europe, um, from Russia. So it's, it's, it's a very diverse mix. And again, English is the main language. Um, Spanish as well, especially with the, the Latin communities that we work with. Um, but yeah, so it, it depends a lot, but indeed the use of translators, especially translators from the communities, I think is key in, in our work um, yeah, to make a, a better connection possible. I hope that answers the question more or less. Okay. Zastanawiam się uh, właśnie nad tym, uh, well, uh, co, uh, I'm just uh, wondering what you need as a human. Uh, uh, what kind of mindset do you need to be brave enough but keep going despite having this fear in you? So what made you be brave enough to help. What kind of resources did you have? What made you not stop after day one of that uh, crisis and keep going and keep helping? Well, Asha seems to be ready. Well, all of us, we work in different volunteer jobs and this is what we share. I'm really happy that we have come together, uh, when I talk to someone about my work, they will, people will respond, I wouldn't be able to do it. I'm so empa uh, um, empa emphatic, I wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, well, in non-verbal terms, before you have this first idea uh, what to do, you can sense people's emotions. and. The, the, the worst thing you can do is to say, don't be sad. The best thing you can do is to feel sympathy and to feel empathy. At the moment of but uh, this is the best thing you can, you can do. Uh, so paradoxically, what you believe may be your weak point, for example, I'm too sensitive, I'm too emotional, this may be your strength, really. Those people believe this is really the best thing you can give them. Well, uh, I think let's reverse this question. What, uh, what was a problem? What did you feel as a burden, as something that maybe you would like to share now that w was a problem back, back then? Well, when I'm thinking about some some obstacles or problems, sometimes we are too critical uh, about ourselves, and you try to convince yourself that you, you you will not make it, and there is this fear that you will not be able to start. Natalia, experiences from Norway here because uh, volunteering is an important part 
or, or has been an important part before 24th of February also, but after so many Ukrainians started coming to so many different countries, many people understood that it's, it's an enormous press helping and one also has to learn different techniques how to help yourself in this situation. And here there are several important moments. You all remember when we take the, uh, take the plane, put the facial mask on yourself first in an emergency such situation. This is something we always have to remember. The, there is a huge responsibility on people coordinating volunteers or all those helpers to teach these people how to help themselves first, because this is an important prerequisite how they can function effectively during the entire period. We cannot help others if we ourselves do not have the resource. Number two, it's extremely important that empathy is the thing, but on the other thing, we have to learn other psychological techniques, how to put the limits. That's extremely important because in this situation we also cannot effectively help others. And also again, the responsibility of the coordinators of volunteers. And Norway has been very good on that before the 24th of February, also because we had uh, lots of activities, just all those activities you mentioned here about helping uh, other refugee kids at the refugee camps and other groups of, of, of uh, refugees and immigrants. And here, uh, different organizations, they always had the courses trainings for the volunteers, how to be volunteer. And this is also extremely applicable now in the situation with, uh, when the war in Ukraine started, because out of a sudden, most of the people, they just throw themselves into, the, into these activities of helping others, and they burn out at the end. And if we burn out at the end, we cannot help more. And then we destroy ourselves, we destroy our families, we destroy relationships. But we are this resource, we help we have to learn how to help ourselves. We have to have this guidance from people coordinating us how to move forward effectively. So uh, I, I believe here we have to learn from each other and to be effective and sufficient ourselves in helping ourselves and others. And this is something I mentioned about helping the helpers. Extremely important thing in, in, in this entire activity. I think that this is the place to support. So... What would you say, Darek, about this support to, to, to volunteers? Uh, maybe from a global perspective. Perpetuum mobile. Yeah, that's again the question about perpetuum mobile that Anya mentioned at the beginning of our talk. Because the city, were, the local community uh, has all the answers to all the questions and a, a very positive energy uh, exploded and people were motivated. So the question, uh, what stops us from working, I believe, or I, I believe you know, we would say nothing, judging by your response, by your behavior, but let's take a step aside and look at this from the side, because I, for example, I wasn't part of your effort at the beginning. Sometimes I feel like a barbarian in, in a garden. I'm trying to uh, not, not to interfere when something is working fine. On the other hand, I feel anxiety about what next. Because what is this perpetuum mobile? What do we need to do to keep going? It's the it's um, the eighth month of the war. It's the eighth month of your hard work. So how to keep it going? Uh, when I was watching that video at the beginning of our panel, I think it is a ready-made manual for different people who perhaps one day will find themselves in a similar situation as yours. So if you listen to those people on the video, you hear about psychological barriers, about the source of strength, about what you should be careful about, what um, motivates you. You have all the answers. But the question remains, this 
kind of uh, crisis doesn't happen every day. It's absolutely extraordinary. So in extraordinary situations, people activate extraordinary resources. And it happened eight months ago, but now it's, as I said, eight months of war. Where is the perpetuum mobile? How to keep this energy going? What the city can do to make this help work. Of course, they shouldn't disturb, that's true, but what can we do to make it go? Uh, in my opinion, the key would be creating good conditions, environment for mutual communication. We have a lot of entities that uh, have been engaged in helping here in Lublin region, but there is a difficulty and a challenge that we uh, encountered from the very beginning was to communicate, to get to know each other, to uh, use this positive energy in a synergic effect, particularly the energy of uh, culture-related uh, organizations, to cooperate, to define one goal uh, without obstructing uh, the actions of one another, you know, to play on one goal and uh, to complement one another and to use this synergic effect. Definitely communication, complementary action, uh, using and best use of resources that we have in situations that can be used. So in a way, complementary rather than uh, overlaps uh, in actions. If you allow me, because I just want to get to know from this debate as much as I can representing the city of Lublin. In a way, I'm, I'm a moderator, but you know, I'm going to use it as a as a, as a person getting to know, as a learner. Let's think about what can we do about these things, what you, when you mean communication, okay, be concrete. I mean, what ideas do you have? What, um, what, conclu what conclusions do you have? Y y you gave us so many good instructions. Let's name it. Let's, let's have it. Let's talk in a terms of, for instance, um, instruments or tools that we can use for our good f f f future. Mm. And of course, this is a question not only for here, but for the panelists, or also our guests online and people in the, in the, in the, in the uh, international dimension because what work what is going to work for Lublin is going to work everywhere else and first of all I would like to 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 mention the perspective uh, what happens with this flow of refugees from Ukraine is absolutely an exceptional situation in terms of numbers I don't think any any, any country here in Europe has experienced such an ex such a huge flow of refugees lately but at the same time we also have to understand that uh, migration is not a crisis as many, as many people describe that migration is the state of, affair, of affairs this 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 time for us in the 21st century when there are big flows of people moving around and integration is going to be a challenge for everyone so all these things we speak about absolutely I don't think we we can expect such an huge such an extreme flow of refugees in any other country or in Poland in the future from other countries but at the same time we have to be prepared that integration is going to be priority number one for everyone and Poland as a country which does not have so much experience with uh, immigration from before it's also kind of a first step I remember I also draw parallels Norway was in the same situation at the beginning of 2000s when we did not have a strategy of integration and every uh, commune, every gmina had the chance to decide themselves how to integrate refugees. And now, uh, well, the change was in 2004 with the new integration law when it was at the state, at the, at the country level, when the integration strategy was uh, introduced. And I believe Poland will come there also when some kind of measures will be defined how to treat all kinds of refugees, not only Ukrainians, how to help people better integrate, how they can learn the language, how children can socialize, and so on and so forth. So this can be a way forward to start defining things and start looking at things not as crisis, but this is a normal thing that people move around in uh, on our planet. And we have to be prepared that different kinds of people will be coming here. And every city, every country would have to deal with that. So I believe this is the next step. Uh, 
thank you so much, Natalia, because this is actually what what is the the very final answer for for the question. I mean, the concrete uh, local or governmental policy, which is actually in the process here. Yeah, that that's for sure. But uh, I'm the, the yeah. What what is, what remains? I'm sorry, I'm popol tak swoim językiem. Panie. Uh, the thing that we have to decide, and it's maybe interesting to think about, look, we are in a very particular kind of situation. Uh, we can do, we can have a lot of uh, conclusions that can help us define policies, uh, state level policies, and we can, we can infer it from your experiences, from the film, and from what you are saying right now. And from my perspective, it's absolutely crucial. I mean, say, tell me, uh, the, the, the most I can have, I'll be ready to have ready-made uh, instructions. Let's use your experience to what can be defined in terms, okay, this is a practice that you can implement. Well, I think the method, the, the, the uh, asking about the method is uh, diversity, diversity of languages, diversity of methods, case studies, uh, discussing stories, narratives, and the only question is how? How do you learn? How do you use these networks and fabrics of stories? Maybe that's a good situation for you to share with all of us here. The storytelling, uh, focusing on what you do, what you pr practically do where you are. We obviously know, you know, we, we know descriptions, we know the organizations, but what really is going on when you are here? Uh, I have a presentation, but maybe I have an idea that I would like to start with. There's the, how to make things concrete, how, how city can help. What is vital is help to those who, uh, uh, to those who help, uh, help the helpers. We, as a... Uh, People working with a lot of traumatic cases, situations, circumstances, we do a lot of psychological help and we also learn how to help. But I think this is crucial and that would be huge, hugely helpful if the city could in a way invest in helping uh, helping the helpers to manage the emotions. And So that's my point number one. Now I'm ready to show you a number of photographs because our organization act mostly in refugee camps. We, are, uh, ref we obviously work in uh, hospitals and, and in uh, uh, social uh, uh, with, with centers for uh, elderly people. But now let's focus on uh, refugee camps. Basically work as these medical clowns. We work in hospitals or medic medically relevant places. The level of stress in hospitals and the kind of irreality of uh, separation from the so-called regular life, this level of stress because of this is very high. We work with kids individually. We do not do performances. Uh, we are not to show off as clowns, as theatrical, or obviously uh, we don't want to downplay this. Uh, this is obviously a very important part of, uh, of, of this work. But our idea is to communicate with a child directly. And the kid is in the center of the communicative situation. We are, we are in a way, uh, we are below the child. We are inferior communicatively in this. Um, OK, so the child is the main player. Uh, so this is a huge occasion to use our language. The language of Im Im impromptu humor is to, is to, um, is to Mm, encourage the child to 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 become to to emerge as a person in communication. Working in a hospital, we have a certain discreteness level of discreteness. Yeah. We are uh, part of operations of surgeries. Um, on the other hand, we uh, we readdress the child's attention, and in a way, there are intermediaries between child uh, between children and doctors. So we, uh, we, you know, we want to divert the. Uh, uh, we, we, we want to be those who come to give ch children instructions, but we are like, um, you know, diverters in a way. What we use in our work, we, I'm, I'm using photographs from different missions because 
międzynarodowa organizacja. As an international organization, we have 30, 40 people uh, who are trained to work in those places like refugee camps. And we have been working mostly in Greece. Uh, uh, we also worked in, in uh, Severodonetsk and in Ukraine, and because of our safety, security, we, we cannot go there. Uh, Bosnia, uh, Serbia, uh, African countries, uh, Sierra Leone, and uh, uh, we are also preparing in, in uh, missions in Africa. Specjalnie na początek wybrałem. Uh, I wanted to uh, present those camps, which are not beautiful spots on the map. They are not shrines, as you can see. So you can see we are, in a way, inadequate. When we go here being joyful, uh, musical, singing, are we there in our place? But in fact, our being out of the blue in this context, uh, because this is why, why it makes people laugh. Uh, because love is what makes people less uh, uh, stressed. Our fern, f first format we use is parades. This is our good morning. There's a lot of music played on uh, uh, natural, I mean, you know, instruments there. We use simple tunes oh, and, and a convention. Okay, let's go on. Let's have a look in your tents, in your, in your places. Um, we are Red Noses. Good morning. That's us here. We are going to be uh, here with you for next three weeks. So this is the first initiative we use. And these are lovely moments because this is Moria uh, camp uh, from before the uh, fire, tragic fire. And the wonderful stuff here is that we get direct contact. We want to have crowds because this is part of this uh, initiative, but there are also one-to-one -one moments. And if someone wants to be one-to-one -one with a five-minute star, it's uh, exactly those tiny, uh, tiny, tiny moments that are so vital. Sometimes it's very old people. We have a young person here, but then the old person comes and say, what's going on here? And, and they leave their tents and, and they start playing with us and communicating by their dances. Or Why do we do this? Because we want, by presenting our skills, well, we use uh, uh, circus conventions because circus is a place for everyone. And you can show any kind of talent. Uh, talent. Those parades very often end in very tiny uh, uh, performances, and we ask kids to participate in workshops. Listen, for three weeks, we will be here and there. You just you have to be, in, to some extent, you have to be structurally well organized for kids. These days, we are here. Then we will leave. We have to communicate that clearly, you know, just to prevent certain stress and, uh, and uh, far away uh, uh, stress. So then we have those workshops. And the workshops, I think, there's always this question of how you understand the word culture. Uh, it's like twofold. One is cultural events, uh, musical events, circus uh, events, and all kind of per performative approach. But culture at the same time is tolerance, equality, st structure of our behavioral patterns. We build certain structures, we build certain beginnings and endings, which always end in relaxation, you know, without avoiding excitement of the highest level when they go to their parents. They need security, they need safety. Culture in our uh, classes is like, okay, you can see the circle, cooperation, coming together. It's a universal language, which is easy to learn, and uh, it's easy to communicate with uh, uh, with everyone, and it stays in your heart. A teraz następny kolej. Uh, next uh, event. Uh, why do we do uh, such events? Because at the end, it's the kids' performance that we have huge show, and the kids are the heroes of these um, of these performances. You can see that the color uh, plastic elements uh, are, look nicely on the photos, in the photos, but you know, you can use every talent you can have, you can imagine. It's a wonderful case where we have heavy uh, uh, load uh, handled so nicely by such a small girl. 
you can see those clan convention that starts rolling. It's absolute hype. You can see uh, you can see 300 people gave her a huge applause. This one moment is a turning point. It's a wonderful uh, experiences, and I can see from the very beginning, kids even are afraid to say their names. In three weeks, they come and say, "I can do this, I can do that," and I think it's empowerment to to a huge extent. We also work with trainers and with refugee staff to give him some kind of fresh, uh, a non-verbal language to uh, to 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 live on. Uh, interpreters, but other people, you know, we can do a lot with body language, and this is absolutely incredible what we can achieve. And we focus on working on women or uh, moms, moms with kids with the disabilities, or just moms with uh, or other women from the camps. So that's more or less my story in, in a nutshell. I like this metaphor of weight to be lifted. This weight seems, you know, overwhelming, but, well, you only try and you can lift it and you have an applause of 300 people. Well, this, this clown convention shows that failure doesn't discourage you to try again. If a child can see an adult who fails, like me as a clown, I pretend not to be able to open the door, and the child says, come on, do it this way, and they do it. So this really stimulates kids to keep trying all the time and gives them a lot of fun. So thank you for broadening this idea of culture. You know what culture is, but it's also the language that we understand, like, for example, how to go around in your daily routines, how to understand space, time, tradition, specific contexts, and with respect, of course, because the point is not to convert everyone to our point of view, right? Yeah, I, uh, let's, let's uh, open the mic to everyone else who would like to share it. Maybe someone from the room? Floor? Uh, Maybe Floor. Floor, would you like to? Tell us, Vincent, Vincent tell us a bit more. I'm not sure, Vincent, if you got my message, because uh, the email exchange sometimes takes more time than talking on the phone. You can share your screen, because I know you have a presentation to, to share with us. It's maybe a good time. Some... We tried the other day. I'm not sure if it's going to work again. If not, just tell us your your stories. Give us your point of view. Should I start, uh, Vincent? Or if you're ready, I, I I wasn't prepared for a presentation. I can give one, but if you can start, then I can find mine somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's no problem. Yes, I also have a, a short presentation prepared. Yes, and I will uh, share my screen and I. Uh, I hope it, it all works out. Let's see. I hope you can see it now. Yeah, we can. Yeah. At least I okay. Can. That's great. Yes. Um, so I would like to tell you a little bit more about uh, what Team Up actually is and answer a few main questions. So what is it? Why do we do Team Up? Uh, who does Team Up? Where does it take place? And how does it all work? Um, and actually, I'd like to start with a very big thank you to the organization for just organizing this great event. It has been so inspiring to listen so far. Uh, and thank you for the option of joining online as well. I'm very sad to not be there in person, but thank you for the invite. Um, and so I'll first dive a little bit into what TeamUp is. So TeamUp is a psychosocial support intervention, which I mentioned uh, earlier. It's created by Save the Children Netherlands, War Child Holland and UNICEF the Netherlands. Um, and as I explained a bit, the basis is structured movement-based activities consisting of uh, games. And these games are based on sports and play, movement and body awareness. And who uh, it is meant for is children from the ages of uh, 6 to 18 who are affected by war or conflict. So children who are uh, on the move. And during their journeys, these children 
as you know, are exposed to stress and traumatic experiences and often their um, social and emotional needs are not met. So that is also why we do Team Up. That is our aim, to improve their psychosocial uh, well-being. And uh, here on the right, you can see the triangle of mental health and psychosocial support levels. And you can see the Team Up operates at the second level, so community and family support. Um, the Team Up really operates in the community. And for example, in Poland, we operate in uh, safe spaces in refugee shelters. Uh, we operate in schools, we're working with teachers and also in community centers. Um, so Team Up does not operate at the top level, you see, of specialized support, but we do have a referral system, meaning that when we notice during uh, sessions of Team Up that there are children that do need additional uh, psychosocial help, we can refer them to specialized support such as uh, psychology. So I'd also like to share a little bit more about how a Team Up is actually implemented. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, facilitators that receive a training in our intervention. Uh, they receive a handbook also and a game book consisting of lots of options for activities and games to do with the children. Um, and after their training, they also continue to be mentored. Maybe this ties a bit into the discussion earlier about how can you help and support volunteers. What we try to do from here is provide continuous mentoring so uh, sometimes in a means of a visit, but also a simple call about how it's going, um, how the facilitators themselves feel um, to evaluate, to improve uh, and to provide support. Um, so uh, these facilitators, they, they can be uh, specialists such as psychologists, but they can also be teachers. They can also be other volunteers that want to be trained in our intervention. Uh, it can be anyone. So ideally, we have uh, one facilitator for a maximum of 25 children. So two can host a session of up to uh, 50 children. Um, and um, the sessions are clearly structured. They are always with, uh, start with an opening, a warm up, a main activity, cooling down and a closing. And the structure is the same in every location of Team Up. And also team of works with um, various gestures um, and routines, and they are also the same for all the team of locations. So if a child moves to a different refugee shelter, they get a sense of recognition because they get the same structure that provides maybe the sense of a safe space. And as I explained, team obsessions are non-verbally, they consist of embodied learning. So body language expression, helping with body awareness, overcoming language barriers between children from different cultural backgrounds. Um, and uh, it is a continuous learning also for the facilitators who work with the children themselves. They plan every session carefully beforehand, uh, choosing which teams to focus on, which psychosocial team, such as a specific emotion that the session will dive into. And then afterwards, they evaluate um, the session also. So what went well, what can be improved, and uh, also whether you notice children that um, during the session that uh, might need to be referred for additional support. And finally, I'd like to show shortly our theory of change. We have developed this based on our work in the field, uh, our experiences when implementing TMAP, as well as research evidence. And this theory shows how the team up activities and games can lead to a chain of results that you see in the colored uh, bubbles that lead to our intended impact. So um, the intent is that we add to the increase of resilience of children and the improvement of psychosocial well-being. Um, and at the bottom, you see all the stakeholders. So who is involved in the intervention? So the parents and caregivers, schools and communities where uh, team up is given, the facilitators, um, implementing partners, governments also. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, evidence has shown that after 12 of team up sessions, you can see uh, some of the impacts on improvement of psychosocial well-being, but also one or two sessions touches upon uh, a few of these bubbles. So they can already show a small impact on the children that they uh, have a positive experience, that stress is reduced, that they can improve uh, social connectedness with other children in the session. Um, because they can connect with children from different backgrounds and team up is really meant to be inclusive uh, for all. Um, 
And yes, this is, I guess, team up really in a nutshell. And I hope it works because I have a small video to show you uh, to really paint a picture of what team up does and what a session looks like. Also, I have it on the next slide, but please notify me if it doesn't work or if you cannot hear uh, the sound. I'm afraid we can't hear the sound. So while you're watching this, I'll tell you about my experience from Team Up. It, of course, aligns with uh, what uh, um, Joanna was talking about, about the red noses. Team Up is also about having fun because the adults sometimes don't know what to do. They need explanation. They need guidance. So this individual contact is important. What we share in our organizations is that we do our best to help the kids feel kids regardless of the conditions. When things collapse, when things go wrong, when they have only one teddy bear taken from home and the home is far away, the child needs some space, needs some fun. And adults, the parents, they need it too. So I, I suppose as you watch the film, mm, perhaps you can recognize some of the activities. I also remember when I started uh, working with Team Up, I saw I had seen certain things before, whether in scouts or in different voluntary activities. But what makes Team Up different from other very sometimes sophisticated methods? Yeah, well, that... mm, because we think that something which is not simple will not work. But indeed, in Team Up, it's relatively simple, but well structured. And it gives the kids the sense of security. You always come, you see the same people in the same place at the same time. They come early, they, there is some music in the background, and you know that you will learn the rules first, they will ask me how I am, and then we will play. So this, is, this creates this sense of security, and it also works with me because I also worked for mm, child's villages before. We don't do anything extraordinary. Uh, we offer children home. And in Team Up, we don't do anything extraordinary. We offer children safe play, safe, safe fun, certain safe routines that even makes adults, facilitators, feel like kids. And this is the common denominator. We are with children, we play with children, and we become children, in a sense, at the same time. That's one of the routines at Team Up. Yeah, indeed, we can feel gifted, of course, with uh, every color of the rainbow. So thank you very much, uh, Team Up. Uh, Vincent, how about you? Are you ready to tell us a bit more about your work? Because uh, the time is getting short, I'm afraid. Sure. Um, I think you can uh, see the OCC slide now, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, I'll just give a quick summary of what we are actually doing at Open Cultural Center. Um, also in a nutshell. So as I was saying, we're in Bar Barcelona here in Spain, um, but we're also in Policastro in Greece next to the Nea Cavala refugee camp. And the main thing that we do are cultural education activities um, and with a specific focus to bring the local communities together with um, the migrant refugee communities that we work with. And that is really the key aspect, both in Barcelona as well as uh, in Policastro. Um, and we are doing many kinds of activities, but all with, with this goal in mind. Specifically in Greece, as I was saying, we are next to the Valley refugee camp. So you can imagine it's a very different context than Barcelona. Um, one side of our work is very much related to uh, mobility, um, because the Valley refugee camp, as many camps, is quite uh, isolated. Um, so it's like six kilometers away from Policastro. Um, and we're not able to enter the camp, so we have to offer our activities uh, within Policastro. 
but to actually allow people to do that, we are offering different mobility services, a bicycle service and also a daily bus service that we provide uh, with a tour provider. Um, so to actually bring the people to our activities and also facilitate going back. Um, what kind of activities do we actually offer in Policasto? Well, it's quite broad. Um, again, all very much focused on inclusion and bringing uh, the different communities together. So we do that through sports, mainly football every week, but also other kind of sports activities. Uh, we have a kindergarten where the kids, while the parents are in our other activities, can be and also have a safe and uh, calm environment um, to be. Um, we have a women's space um, where specifically obviously the women from the camp uh, can be and, and uh, be also in a safe space. Um, we offer all kinds of workshops from employability workshops to also more IT related workshops or uh, safeguard any, any kind of workshop uh, related, um, well helpful to the communities that we work with. Uh, and then we also offer many language classes um, in different languages, also depending on uh, the volunteers that we have at that point, because we work mainly with volunteers as well. Um, so mainly we teach Greek uh, and English, uh, but sometimes also Spanish and German. If you look at Barcelona, especially in the beginning, it was a bit more focused on awareness raising, especially because our project started in Greece. Um, in 2016. Um, so we were focusing a lot on creating awareness about the situation of refugees and migrants uh, in Greece or other parts of Europe um, through events uh, and through uh, talks uh, and also being at other events. Um, but in the meantime, we have also created a language lab. Um, so since we're in Barcelona, we, we made it a bit more uh, hip by calling it the language lab, but it's the same idea, teaching lang uh, languages to both newcomers, but also to locals by newcomers. So uh, someone teaching Arabic to local Catalan Spanish people, um, but also having Spanish classes given by uh, local people from here. Um, so that is one important part of our work now in Barcelona as well. And specifically, I want to quickly zoom in into this program that we started uh, in 2019 and where we basically started teaching coding uh, and other tech uh, skills to refugees and migrants in Barcelona for free. Um, basically, with this logic in mind that education can really make a big change, as we already discussed earlier today. Um, but yeah, basically providing free tech education um, to, to help people upskill and actually find proper jobs in the tech sector. Um, so more stable jobs, more well-paying jobs, uh, high quality jobs, basically. And we do that through these four pillars. Um, well, free education, um, we focus a lot on labor integration. So we're also in contact with the tech industry, with recruiters to find these opportunities for students. Uh, we have a strong community focus as well on this program, so working a lot with local volunteers to again bring people together. Uh, and we also offer additional support, um, so that can be legal advice, it can be psychological support, it can be mentoring, or other kinds of more individually based uh, services. Um, and just shortly, this is our impact, we see two students here, you see already the diversity. Uh, Ali is from Pakistan on the right. Um, he's actually working with us now um, because the MicroCorp program is almost fully um, graduate run. So people graduated in the program. And Ananda is working in free now. I'm not sure how familiar the taxi app is outside Spain, but it's a, it's a big app in Spain and she has their job as a software engineer. And she is part of those uh, 154 graduates we've had since uh 2019 um, made possible by a huge volunteer community as you can see um yeah there was our organization as well quite quickly um i hope it gave a good idea of what we do um thank you very much as well for the invitation and for uh, allowing us to to present what we do Thank you very much. I believe that sharing experiences, sharing that we are in, in, in right now, is something that should continue and should be a uh, empowerment for, to all of us. Uh, the, the stronger feeling that teams, that groups, that working together is, makes us safer, makes us more accepted, and when somebody feels the same, we feel supported in what we do. And because we have heard so many 
stories about, on the one hand, you have to be spontaneous and reacting to incentives and uh, uh, and uh, stimuli. But on the other hand, you have to build certain rituals. Um, and this is this magic mix, a kind of golden middle um, that you have to uh, that you have to build and uh, this uh, but there is this kind of leverage this kind of consequence to living so all our actions must be justifiable in how they change the lives the lives of others now uh, do you want to ask a question my, my, the voice comes now to the people in the in the room do you want to ask questions do you want to react in a way uh, you can raise your hand, and if you just feel free to take part in the discussion. Yes, yes. Yeah, there is just one voice. I'll pass the mic to the person. My name is Oksana Derkach. I'm from Poltava, and I'm affected by the work that you do in Lublin. I just want to use this opportunity to thank you. Well, I'd like to take uh, the liberty of uh, saying thank you for for your approach to our kids, for what you do um, uh, for our mothers. Yesterday at a concert, uh, part of this congress, uh, I was very touched with uh, what I saw. Uh, Lublin is now very dear to us. I also work at the Council of Europe. So I will, of course, uh, pass this message of this Congress elsewhere in Europe. I also in, I'm also into many many different projects. So I'd like to talk to you during the break, perhaps if there is a chance about some of these. Тут день добрый. Может не питание, а мы приготовились детьми. Well, this is not a question, but I just wanted to tell you about. Olena Sarnowska. Well, let me. Olena doesn't speak Polish very well, but we'll try to manage this. Olena. Um, she works with with uh, Ukrainian kids in in temporary shelters. Yes, I. When I spoke to kids about a meeting that we come together for a meeting, the kids wanted to. Uh, when they learned that I am coming here to talk to you, the children told me to thank you for all the positive emotions that they have been receiving experiencing in Poland, in Lublin, and, and the kids prepared what they called the drops of love. Can someone help me hand it out, maybe? This is a gift uh, for you. These are not some, you know, extraordinary artistic works. Maybe the language is not fully correct, what it says there. But from the bottom of their heart, they wanted to say thank you to all of you, everyone who takes care of us, of the kids, and you give us a chance to think about the future, think about nature, think about everyday routines, and forget about the war for a moment. And we will keep working together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olenka. This is very moving. And, well, to close, I'd like to thank uh, Wukash for uh, giving uh, some ideas of, of Team Up. I remember one exercise from Team Up. Maybe we can do it together right now. I know, Wukash, you were not ready for that. Nobody was ready, actually. But let's try it. Well, I'll take off my jacket. Uh, finally, I can do this. So, Robota. let's say together, everybody, well done. Great job. Okay? So, let's, guys, uh, stand up. Floor, uh, Floor, Vincent, stand up, if you're ready.
Good job. Good job. Good job. Now the same in Ukrainian. Now in Polish. Dobra robota. Dobra robota. Dziękujemy wam wszystkim. Przekazujemy dobrą energię i zostańcie z nimi. Thank you all. Uh, thanks for everything you've done and for coming here together to share. And great thanks to our ghost, to our to our house, sorry, online. Take care guys.